Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to this Institute lecture. At the end of the lecture, there'll be an opportunity for questions. Today, our speaker is Enrico Bombieri. Enrico has been a professor in the School of Mathematics here at the Institute since 1977, and IBM von Neumann professor since 1984. He was born in Milan, and completed his university studies there, becoming a professor then in mathematics in Pisa in 1966. He was a member here in 1973 to 74, and then from 1974, he was professor at the Scuola Normale in Pisa. Enrico's work ranges widely over many areas of mathematics, from algebra and algebraic geometry to analytic number theory, but it centers on number theory and analysis. In 1974, he was awarded a Fields Medal for his work on the classical mathematical problem of the distribution of prime numbers. In recent years, his work has been mainly concerned with Diophantine approximation and Diophantine geometry, which is concerned with the solution of equations and inequalities using integers. And apart from being one of the world's leading mathematicians, Enrico has many other interests. He's a talented artist and printmaker, a distinguished collector of postage stamps and of seashells, but today he's going to talk about the mathematical truth. Well, the first thing, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So, the lecture will be on a topic which is really not my field, because I'm not a logician or a philosopher. But it's interesting to me because studying the question, what is truth in mathematics, helped me to some extent to understand what I'm doing. So, let's see first something which was said in 1653. In uh, his book, The Complete Angler, Isaac Walton said that angling, the art of fishing with, the <coughs> with fly fishing, may be said to be so like the mathematics that it can never be fully learned. At least not so fully, but that there will still be more new experiments left for the trial of other men that succeed us. Well, this is still true today. Mathematics can never be fully learned. So, <clears throat> what is mathematical truth? Uh, I will show now a couple of uh, alternatives. First one, an absolute. Truth is truth. That's the end of the story. There is no, <clears throat> no choice about what is truth. Second, well, no, 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 no. It's a relative notion. Truth depend on the, depends on the context in which, in which you work, in which you assert uh, your truth. Other point of view, well, it's a tautology. I mean, it just has no importance whatsoever. For, well, this, this skeptic will say does not exist, never existed, in fact. And the, some social scientists will say, well, it's a product of culture. And uh, in studying what truth can possibly mean, it turned out that maybe it's a mix of all these things. So let me begin with the absolute, which starts with the platonic view that numbers, in particular geometry, and from there mathematics, exist <coughs> on, in the platonic world of ideas as absolutes. Well, this is a bit narrow. The, the 
practice has shown that this view is a bit narrow, and it has been some philosopher proposed, you know, alternative uh, uh, form of Platonism called pl plentiful Platonism, which allows for the existence of an objective set of distinct mathematics. Uh, okay. So, <clears throat> the uh, realist view is therefore that mathematics exists independently of us. But mathematicians also believe that mathematics is not just formulas, propositions, and theorems. And Hardy's view is quite explicit, and we'll see in a moment. The other view of mathematics is uh, partially constructive. Yeah, mathematics is there, but we construct it at the same time. So it's a construction of the mind, or perhaps the collective mind, because uh, really it comes, the mathematics is the, formed by the work of many people, of all mathematicians from, from all times. So the role of the, mathematics, uh, the mathematician is like an architect. And instead, in platonic <coughs> thing, it will be an explorer of a world which exists on its own. The problem of formalism, uh, which uh, we'll talk a little more in a moment, is that infinite constructions quickly lead to paradoxes, to contradictions, to things which do not make sense, uh, at least in plain English. So I'll give an example. The Russell paradox is the, you define a set, set an aggregate of <laughs> objects, and you say, I want to define from a, a new set R, which the elements of R are sets, and the, those sets which, for which the set itself is not an element of, of the set. So, for example, is the universe as a set also an element of the universe? Well, you decide, but I mean, it's, uh, it's a question of this type. And uh, the fact is, if, if you take literally, uh, you see right away that it does not make sense. So, how you resolve these things? Uh, well, you push, push it away, and <coughs> the <coughs> you just keep going and try to restrict uh, the definition of set or the operations of set. Can you talk about the set of all sets? Is that a set or not? And <coughs> so that's a way mathematicians, they keep changing the, in the formalistic view, they keep changing the rules, excluding certain constructions or allowing other constructions until uh, things look more or less uh, okay. So, <clears throat> mathematicians said they like to be, uh, to take the view, the platonic view, that mathematics is there, and we try to simply to understand it. Uh, in practice, a mathematician is, on the weekdays, is a formalist. On weekends, is a platonic. There are other views of mathematics. The intuition is everything in mathematics must be effectively defined. Mathematical entities do not exist until they have been constructed. Empiricism says mathematics is the result of empirical research. It's like any other science. Lacatosh, uh, the quasi-empiricism, 
uh, questions the validity of mathematics, then that's a good postmodernistic uh, view. Uh, you start by destroying everything and then you put it together in a different way. Social constructivism is product, mathematics a product culture and uh, it does not exist until it's been thought out. Mathematics is shaped by the fashions of the social group doing it. Well, perhaps uh, uh, this may be true in some aspects. There is some fashion in mathematics uh, at any given time because certain type of mathematical research maybe is more attractive. There, there is a feeling that there are many, many results, new results to be discovered with a relatively uh, simple effort. And so everybody shifts into the field until it's been uh, explored completely or, or becomes too difficult. And so uh, certainly there is some aspect of that. On the other hand, uh, one can find many examples of mathematics done quite independently by <coughs> different groups or different mathematicians and with essentially identical construction. And I have an example in which I was part of of that. There were a Japanese mathematician did something did the, and they did exactly the same thing quite independently and uh, I was very surprised that it turned out that way but if you think about it, uh, it was not so surprising after all. So uh, fictionalism, mathematics meaningless in absolute is at best a useful fact, fiction. Well, maybe. There is another type of mathematics, applied mathematics, the subject of study as it roots in the description of reality. Uh, well, let's see the opinion. It's very hard to describe actual phenomena by simple mathematical models. It certainly, uh, a century ago, it was really hard. Today, mathematics has become rather sophisticated and uh, models which were considered too difficult to study today maybe are approachable. Hardy, uh, famous uh, British mathematician, in his book uh, Mathematician's Apology, uh, took a, a dim view of applied mathematics saying most of the finest products of an applied mathematician's fancy must be rejected as soon as they have been created by the brutal but sufficient reason that they do not fit the facts. Well, uh, as an example, sophisticated mathematical models and investment in finance uh, turn out to be grossly insufficient to take into account the distinction between real wealth and paper profits as everybody knows by personal experience. <laughs> uh, well, this can be solved by introducing in the system what I call Bombieri's law. Uh, not this Bombieri, but Bombieri the father, the banker. Bombieri laws have finance. Profits are on paper, losses are in cash. <laughs> And perhaps if one would take into account such simple constraints, uh, things would be a little easier. Well, mathematicians believe that mathematical objects are not just proposition theorems. And what matters, Hardy's view, is the pattern. In other words, the, the whole construction is more important than an end result or a special statement like a theory. And it says that, that in doing mathematics, the mathematicians work in a creative fashion, like a painter or a poet. So these ideas are very close to 
uh, Wittgenstein, for example, aspects in which uh, the aspect of things is very important. And in the same way that a, painter, a, pa a painting is not just a collection of molecules on a canvas and uh, which produce certain vibrations in you know, you know, light, which we, where we see as colors and lines and shapes. It, or even worse, that is a collection of, of just atoms in a certain way. Uh, it's the aspect of the painting which, is, which matters, which gives the substance to it. So my own view in this uh, is the mathematics is the science of relations. What matter, matters is the relation. And uh, in that respect, it, so it studies how different uh, things interact. <clears throat> so patterns are aspects of relations and sometimes can be identified with the relations. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> sometimes relations are not patterns, and so it's not quite the same thing. Anyway, here is truth uh, in the Renaissance. Here is a famous fresco of uh, Raphael, the School of Athens in the Vatican and represents rational truth, and there is uh, the dual aspect of that, the theological truth is another fresco. And uh, I'm interested here in the rational truth, and you will see uh, here is Plato, here Aristotle's, uh, this guy here is Euclid, uh, this one here is Pythagoras. Um, let's see, here is Ptolemy and Zoroaster. And so many of the characters uh, here represent the famous philosophers or scientists, astronomers, mathematicians of antiquity. Uh, so let's see the next one to maybe this a little more clear. That's Pythagoras with, <clears throat> and Euclid here. The model for Euclid actually was a carpenter, a friend of Raphael. So the question about mathematics and truth, is classical mathematics free from contradiction? Well, uh, that's not clear at all. In fact, uh, uh, my colleague uh, Vladimir uh, expressed some serious doubts that today's mathematics is free from contradiction. And uh, also uh, studying ideas how to get around difficulties of this type. It's obvious that some large part of mathematics today is certainly free from contradiction but uh, how to get convinced about that? It's, that's another question. Does mathematics deal with truth? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. In fact, sometimes there's a lot of mathematics which is made under assumptions which are not verified. So even if the logic may be correct, the conclusion may be wrong because the premise may be wrong. So can truth prove, truth is the same as proof or verification? Uh, the answer is no, we'll see in a moment. Truth or proof be achieved by consensus? Well, uh, that will be maybe the, the, the social science point of view. Uh, it's a question uh, which is also, you know, you can give a whole lecture about that, uh, for example, uh, you start with the problem of refereeing a paper. Is, uh, how do you know that the paper is correct? Uh, so you send to a referee, and maybe if this turned out to be a bit difficult, you send to a second referee, maybe to the third one, 
you try to get a consensus, and then you accept it. Or maybe you go to uh, some mathematician friend, uh, say, you know this thing better than me. Is that correct? And he says, yeah, I think so. The guy is pretty strong. He's a good mathematician. It must be correct. <laughs> and then uh, you keep going on. So uh, one has to be a little careful about that. Is there a notion of probable truth? Uh, that's a very interesting question. We'll see at the very end. And is automatic verification uh, by computer acceptable in mathematics? Some mathematicians say, no way. And uh, I will say, absolutely, yes. So <clears throat> the, now I'll talk a bit about uh, truth in formalistic mathematics. Hilbert proposed a program to obtain a complete axiomatization of mathematics and proof of consistency, starting from the assumption of the consistency of a small number of intuitive basic axioms. And uh, it turns out that any sufficiently large model of mathematics cannot prove its consistency within itself. End of the story. So Gödel brought down the, the whole Hilbert program. And of course, we don't know whether the zermelo frankel set theory, which is used today as foundation of mathematics, whether it really is sufficiently large, uh, uh, but probably it is. So I don't think that. Uh, uh, Sir Melo Frankel theory prove, can prove its consistency within itself. So, what do we do? Well, uh, the formalization continues successfully with the Bourbaki key group. With the axiomatization, large parts of algebra, analysis, and geometry. And uh, some things were relatively is a bit easier to formalize that the um, uh, other parts of mathematics were not so easy to formalize, for example, nonlinear non analysis. And uh, so ent entire sectors were excluded, at least initially, from its program. And it, so it, the result was a bit of lopsided. Um, uh, development, at least uh, in my view. On the other hand, the Bourbaki had a very good uh, influence by unifying the language of mathematics. A very positive influence. Now, the <coughs> formalization of truth in a formalistic model is possible. How do you do that? Uh, this was done by Tarski in a famous paper. It's not a long paper, but uh, uh, pretty deep. Tarski's solution is you have to deal with a very well-known paradox. Uh, when I say this sentence is false, well, if it's false, then it must be true. If it's true, then it's false. So which is which? How you solve this paradox? So, if you have the axiom, uh, the symbol A or negation of A is true, so it means any statement is either true or false. One of the two must happen. And that, this is, by the way, classical philosophy, Aristotelian philosophy, scholastic philosophy. Uh, for all the Western civilization uh, has been founded on that. So suddenly you say uh, you cannot define truth. Then you don't know what truth is. So how do you solve the problem? The solution to the problem it can be exemplified by this phrase. Snow in white is white, in commas, is true if and only if snow is white. Now, this is an actual phrase. Uh, Tarski was having a, a discussion with the philosopher Carnap 
in a cafe, I think in Prague, I'm not sure, um, about the notion of truth. And Carnap, Carnap asked, but what do you think truth is? And he said this phrase. And it became, and, and Carnap understood that the, the first Nois White was only a sentence. And the second is an affir affirms the sentence, it's a proposition. And that solves the, 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 the problem in a certain sense. And Carnap then understood what, what he meant. So this is, a, this is an anecdote, but uh, Carnap himself uh, uh, tells the story. And uh, <clears throat> so, how do you do it? I will not do the technicalities because that I, I will not be able to explain that. But the definition of truth in a language L, so alphabet, collection of words, phrases according to a syntax, must be given in another language called, let's call meta language, ML. The meta language contains within itself a copy of the language and should be able to talk about sentences and the syntax of the smaller language. The meta language should contain a symbol true, where true x means x is a true sentence of L. So it's, it's a predicate uh, attached. Definition of true is a sentence deformed for all x, true x, if and only if phi of x of phi is a function in the meta language, and true is not uh, appear there. Otherwise, you get a self referential definition. And the equivalence if and only if must be provable using axiom in the meta language that do not contain again true. Well, you want so a convention that what you think true should be uh, should follow should be actually uh, a property of, of, of T. So the, the language L, the convention T makes the, the liar paradox inevitable. So to avoid the problem, the meta language should be much larger than L. And then Tarski shows that in this case, if it is really much larger, you can find a formula in ML in the meta language, which defines the truth in the smaller language. Does not define truth in the whole thing, just in the smaller language. And uh, the intuitive truth, uh, the negation of A is true if and only A is not true, and so on. The, the, the A <coughs> um, or B is true if and only if A is true or B is true. I mean, this is plain, plain English, and uh, this is aspects of convention T. Okay, so the advantage <coughs> is, so the mathematicians, how work, it works. It turns now, Tarski notion of truth for L will be, say, mathematically, the Zermelo, Frankel, Axiom, and and the and L, the meta language, uh, ML, uh, I wrote L, but it should be ML. The meta language will be just plain English because we write sentences in plain English. <coughs> and uh, well, this will be satisfactory until someone finds Zermelo Frankel axioms are contradictory and. Uh, uh, that might happen. In that case, we change the axiom, we continue with a different language, and, uh, and we'll find out some way around it. Now, to show, show quickly an example why this is a very famous example about the notion of truth, it's showing that something may be the notion of truth really changes according to the choice of the meta language. So, 
the continuum hypothesis is the following. The simplest infinity, uh, Aleph zero, is the infinity counting. One, two, three, uh, infinity. Well, uh, uh, some, um, there is a, an Amazonian tribe that counts one, two, infinity. Uh, however, you know what, what I mean. <laughs> so the continuum is the set of all real numbers. Oh, by the way, cardinality means the totality, the how big. Uh, it uh, will not give a formal definition. Uh, what is a real number? Well, Eudoxus defined essentially real numbers by the following, by considering all fractions less than uh, something and all fraction greater than that something, two things. Uh, and this was uh, actually um, formalized by Dedekind. And it coincides, in a sense, with the notion that the real number, it's uh, think of, of some decimal number, you write all the digits. There's only one little rule. You cannot have a number like uh, 0 0.9999999 uh, without, because that number is one. You have to make that kind of identification. So, yeah, that will be the continuum. And Cantor showed that the, if you take all subsets of the natural integers, that's a set, uh, that has the, as many elements as the continuum. So, uh, it's written that way because if you take, for example, a set consisting of one element, uh, the only subsets are the empty set and the set itself. Say. So there are two elements, two subsets. If I have two elements A and B, the subsets are the empty element, the element A, element B, and A and B together. There are four of them, two squared. If I have the subsets of, uh, of a set with three elements, there are two to the power of three. There are eight subsets. You can count, you can figure out. So the subset of, of a set of contains n elements are two to the n, and that's the reason why he writes uh, two to the power aleph zero. It's a consistent notation. And Cantor then sh sh tried to see whether, uh, <coughs> Uh, show that the continuum has many, many more elements than, than, the, um, than the set of, uh, than Aleph zero. It's uncountable. Well, suppose I started putting some numbers at random and uh, like that. Well, you take what, what is called a diagonal marker, for example, the digit six, digit zero, digit zero, digit nine, digit five, digit two, seven, and so on, and obtain this number. So the nth digit is the coincide with the nth digit of the nth element in the list. And now you change it. You change every digit. For example, you add one if the digit is uh, less than eight. Uh, you have to avoid the nine, nine, and nine. So if eight and nine, you, you remove one. Okay, so you get a number which cannot be in the list. So you cannot put the, the continuum in a list uh, of this type. So, on the other hand, okay, let's see how it works that way. This will be how you try to reach the continuum. Every time, this will done, is done with the digits, say, zero and one. Think of that as zero. This is 0, .0. Uh, This is 0 0.1. 
uh, this is 0 0.00, this point 0 0.01, this point uh, said 0 0.01, so this point 0 0.010, zero, this is point uh, 0 0.011, <coughs> and so on. Uh, that will is the continuing binary, uh, binary digits. Okay, so by do, going this way, the limit is the continuum. Okay. So, what is the continuum hypothesis? Well, uh, there's something called the axiom of choice, which allows you to, from any aggregate of sets, any collection of sets, to choose one element from each set. It, does not tell you how. It tells you that you can do that. Then you can compare cardinalities. So there is a first cardinal number greater Aleph 1, greater than Aleph 0. And the continuum hypothesis uh, is Aleph 1 equal to the continuum. Uh, Cantor tried to find something in between, it could not, and uh, then formulated the hypothesis that the first uncountable cardinal is the continuum. Uh, there's a common mistake, which is repeated again and again in popular uh, writings in you know, mathematics, that the C equal to LF0 is the continuum hypothesis. No, that is the definition of C. So be careful if you read. Um, this type, you know, popular uh, expositions. So, Gödel proved in 1940 that the continuum hypothesis is consistent with the uh, um, Zermelo Frankel and axiom of choice. In 1963, Paul Cohen, here at the Institute, proved that the negation of the continuum hypothesis is also consistent. So, is that a contradiction? No, because the consistency is, requires to amplify the Zermelo-Frankel uh, choice uh, axioms, and, and uh, uh, you have two different ways of amplifying the system in a coherent fashion. Uh, and in one system, then you can uh, assume the continuum hypothesis as an axiom. In the other system, you can assume the negation of the continuum hypothesis as an axiom. So this tells you that truth is, depends at least in the formalistic models, depends on, <coughs> on the extension that you, that you make, the, the extension of the uh, mathematical language you have accepted up to a given moment. So is one model better than the other? Well, uh, some, uh, uh, better is uh, subjective. So mathematicians end up by uh, getting guided by aesthetic considerations, intuition, simplicity of arguments, linearity of patterns, and so on. And there is no definite rule for that, and, and uh, views uh, differ on, on this. Uh, from, there is no unanimous choice, I mean, what is better. So, is truth the same as proof? Answer, no. And there is a theorem of combinatorics. I will not explain, I don't, don't want to be too technical, but is related to properties of coloring of, <coughs> of graphs. Of, think uh, of the following. Uh, take, for example, um, uh, five points join them in all possible ways. What you get is uh, a star pentagon inside a pentagon. 
Now, color the edges with two colors, red and blue. Then you'll discover pretty easily that if you color the star pentagon in blue and the uh, outside pentagon in red, there is no triangle of the same color with edges of the same color. If you do it with six points, then you discover no matter you do the coloring, you will find a triangle with that property. Now, what happens if you try to do the, the same thing with, say, uh, six points? Nobody knows. What is known that you can find uh, a, a complete, um, uh, say, you want to, instead of triangle, say the next uh, case will be a tetrahedron, in, uh, with, and you want to find a tetrahedron with the same color. So that will be four vertices. Well, if the set of points is big enough, you can find such an object. If uh, with five, yeah, if the set is big enough, you can find uh, uh, five points in which all, all, all the um, segments uh, joining them will have the same color. How many vertices do you need? Uh, some number between 45 and 49. And nobody knows how to compute that because the number of possible cases to examine is so big that the question is still open. Now, the, this is the very special case of the theorem of Ramsey on, in combinatorics. There is a little twist in which you put just a little extra condition which looks very innocuous. Well, if you use Armel Frankel axioms, you can do an infinite version of the problem. And once you have done the infinite version, you can do the finite version. And then you know that affirmative answer that you can get this extra coloring with the extra condition. Now, in each case, each finite specialization is a finite calculation, and theoretically, you, you could, should be able to check all cases. So uh, the fact is that, this, uh, the uh, that you have an affirmative, uh, the finite version as an affirmative solution is not provable in the standard arithmetic. That, that's uh, kind of sobering. Uh, sobering fact. So here I may have an example of truth which you cannot prove in the system in which you work. If you expand the system a bit, then you can prove it. So truth in other models, uh, well, I would say Something about uh, Arthur Fields' uh, fictionalism. Mathematics is dispensable. You can do with everything without mathematics. Well, well, maybe. Uh, the statements cannot talk about reality. It's at best a useful fiction, maybe. Mathematics statements such as one plus one equal two is meaningless in absolute and true only in the fictional world of mathematics. Uh, if you go uh, on, on, the comp on the web, you find the following statement. Um, a statement like 2 plus 2 equals 4 is just as false as Sherlock Holmes live at 22B Baker Street. But both are true according to the relevant fiction. Um, mm. Mathematician answer, 2 plus 2 is true in primitive recursive arithmetic and also for the layman. And it's false in characteristic 2 or 3. The second statement is false for the brutal but sufficient reason that Sherlock Holmes lived at 22, 1 capital B, Baker Street. And here is a reference. 
uh, in fairness to Wikipedia to say this mistake was corrected uh, a few months later. <coughs> but I have a copy of that. Empiricism is uh, mathematical truth contingent to observation. Quasi-empiricism, the postmodernism <coughs> post uh, applied to mathematics, questions the validity of mathematics because not only truth can be, uh, validity can be proved from the uh, beginning to the end, but in fact the falsity from the conclusion to premises uh, can also occur. Uh, in other words, uh, this is related to the question of the uh, logical system being non-contradictory. So, well, empiricism got support from string theory, but general relativity got support from mathematics. The relevant uh, geometry, uh, differential geometry of uh, <clears throat> space in high dimension was developed by Riemann 50 years, and uh, the uh, tensor calculus uh, needed uh, uh, was ready for uh, Einstein and uh, provided to be a very right, important tool. So you have to be a little careful with when we go to popular journalism. Otherwise, we talk about things. We have names, uh, black holes, and quarks, and quanta. Uh, uh, the quants are something else. Uh, and uh, I've seen uh, on TV uh, some imaginary depictions of black holes, which are really uh, like, a, like a rotating funnel and so on. And it, it's simply just, it's not, that's not, it's not the, the reality of black holes. Intuitionism, uh, okay, mathematical objects cannot be considered unless obtained by uh, explicit construction. So, the, the axiom that something is either true or false, you can use that if you decide separately whether something is true or false. You cannot say one of the two is correct. So, uh, this is uh, restrictive, but uh, the uh, Gödel incompleteness theorem still holds in intuitionistic mathematics, does not help to, to solve the problem of non-contradiction. Uh, the evidence statement, they put three objects in two boxes, so one box contains at least two elements. It is not acceptable in intuitionism unless you tell which box. So it's uh, quite restrictive. But mathematicians have tried to see how far you can go with that, and it turns out a large part of calculus, uh, almost all of calculus and almost all of analysis can be done in intuitionistic mathematics, with some contortions. But. So I'll give an example, and then I will conclude. Uh, consider the function that counts the number of primes up to x. Uh, it's an integral of log, but, but it's very computable. You can put x a number, and uh, it's uh, not difficult to compute a very good approximation. And the prime number theorem says that the number of primes up to x and this number are very close. Okay. Of course, I put this, this thing because I really like prime numbers, so, so I have to promote myself a little bit. So the Riemann hypothesis uh, is the statement that the gap, the approximation, is not much more than the square root of, of x. In fact, it's equivalent to the statement uh, for x greater than 2657. Okay. Now, Riemann noticed already 
that the number of primes up to x, uh, up to 3 million, is less than this quantity. And commented it on that. The Riemann had a formula for pi of x, and, but the formula had L i of x was the first term, but there were other terms, and those terms are oscillatory. And the Riemann commented that it will be interesting in his subsequent research to see the effect of these oscillatory terms on, the, on pi of x. Now, calculation with computers showed that pi of x is less than L i of x, x uh, less than 10 to the 23. That's a pretty big number for a computer. But in 1955, Stanley's Q's proved there's a number x less than 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 1,000 for which pi of x is greater than L i of x. Oh. So numerical evidence by computer maybe is not always to be so, uh, so evident. The skewers argument two parts. The first was done in 1933 and shows that it holds on the assumption of the Riemann hypothesis. The number was a little smaller. The 1,000 was 34. Hardy commented, this certainly is the biggest number that ever served a specific purpose in mathematics. Well, in 1955, we came up with a bigger number because that was as obtaining, assuming the failure of the Riemann hypothesis. And then, by the principle of the excluded middle, you can say, there is a sign change within the larger of the two. This is not valid in intuitionistic mathematics, at least this proof. But still, he came up with a very specific number. And well, can you ever compute where the change is? On the real hypothesis has been narrowed to something very precise, 1.39. 7, 9, 1.3984 uh, times 10 to 316. This is likely to be the very first point. I mean, it's somewhere in between. It's a very large interval, actually. But somewhere in between, it will be the first point where you get a side change. Well, my time is up. So I will only mention that. Um, Today, there are many other aspects of truth, especially in the question of proof and verification of by computers, uh, proof by consensus. Uh, if you have a proof, say, of 10,000 pages, which is the case for uh, solution of the problem of finding all finite simple groups. Uh, nobody can read 10,000 pages of condensed mathematics without uh, burning his brain. So um, the thing has been done in pieces and uh, eventually goes through revision and revision and uh, eventually consensus will say, yeah, it is a theory. We know this, the solution. And we are getting close to that, but it will take another uh, several years to before uh, to be totally convinced. Computer-assisted proofs are getting better and better, and my prediction is that uh, the computer will play a bigger and bigger role in the future of uh, mathematics. Thank you. Time for one or two questions. How, how do you view a probabilistic uh, proofs of statements? Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, the probabilistic proof 
is uh, obtained by taking, say, conventional proof. And it has been shown that you can, at least theoretically, rewrite it in a formal way, just a bit longer, not, not excessively longer. And then you take a little sample, just three, three clauses, and check whether it's correct or not. Well, if it says false, you, you just take everything put in the waste basket. If it says it's true, it may still be false, but your sample, uh, the give me a wrong answer will be <clears throat> probably probability is less than it's just say around 50 percent. So you take another random sample. It says false because the sample is independent. The is, sorry, is, that this happens is 25%. Well, if you do this, say, 50 times, the probability is that the computer gives a false answer is less than the number of atoms in the universe. So it's, uh, you say, okay, it's, uh, after all, this, all these things that by humans, it's a human proof. So that eventually this thing will be uh, put in practice, maybe. So no more refereeing. <laughs> this does not exclude the uh, old way of looking at proofs, chop the thing, interesting pieces, and check and see how it's connected and so on. Further questions? Do any mathematicians pursue this uh, intuitionist mathematics or constructive mathematics anymore? Has that been abandoned and they... they oh, yes. No, no, no. Uh, it's... Uh, the, the many models have been proposed, in fact, even doing away completely with these uh, merle frankel axioms. Uh, in, the difficulty of the merle frankel axiom is there are too many sets in a set. So there are, if you start putting uh, serious constraints on, on what is constructible, what is acceptable, uh, uh, mathematics will be a little different. Some things cannot be done anymore. But uh, in practice, you know, instead of proving a general theorem which encompasses everything, you prove something less, but what you're really interested in uh, is still, uh, will still be proved. as a meta-language in the Tarski construction? Uh, that's a good question. Well, I have to say there, there's, uh, after the first study of the um, language of the Amazonian tribe, there came a second study that says they do not count one to infinity. So I don't know. Uh, the, the fact, uh, uh, say plain English or plain, plain Italian, for example, since that was, was my um, native language. Uh, that's the way we communicate. Maybe someday we'll start communicating by telepathy, and, and, and that will be a different language. Just communicate by feelings. Uh, that's another language. So, um, so we do... Uh, what we can do. The important thing is to keep uh, the, you know, the mind open. And if we have to change, we change. Already there are pretty strong restrictions on the use of plain language, in, in plain English in mathematics. You have to be very careful. You cannot be sloppy. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Let's thank Enrico again for a fine lecture.